Thank you for joining us. Take it away, Reverend. Well, thank you. I know this is not the general day that I show up, which is Thursdays, but it's happy to, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I met Monica Miller because she is an extraordinarily good church state litigator, and uh, she's the legal director of the American Humanist Association's Legal Center. And then some years ago, I also learned that she's an attorney with the Non-Human Rights Project, which is trying to get personhood status for, well, we'll let her explain exactly what kinds of animals. But Monica Miller is with us. Monica, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. You were involved in an extraordinary case, truly unique case in American jurisprudence a few years ago, seeking habeas corpus, in other words, a release of the body of one elephant, Happy, who has spent the last 40 years incarcerated in the Bronx Zoo. Let's talk a little bit about Happy. How did the zoo acquire Happy? In the first well, place, we know that she was kidnapped from from Thailand from her family um, and she was put into some sort of performance thing in, in Florida. And then after about seven years, she was bussed up to the Bronx Zoo. Um, yeah, where she was also then forced to perform tricks and do stuff that we now know is completely wrong. Um, but they still kept her in a, a very small enclosure um, for her needs. And there's been sanctuaries that have been available since uh, for quite some time now. Where is she living right now at the Bronx Zoo? And and it's seasonal. I mean, it's bad enough in the summer. It gets much worse in the winter. That's right. So they have like a barn um, with these like two by two cells, like these cells that basically is like half, like twice the size of her body. And that's basically where they keep the elephants there's only two elephants now which is also just horrific because they're both female elephants and they need um to be part of a pack and be social species and these two are actually they don't get along so they're separated um so they're both isolated in a small enclosure and they're either at most they have access to a one acre pen um where in the wild they'd be moving up to 20 hours a day which is sometimes like 50 miles um you know, over ancient migratory routes. So it's really, um, it's really tragic how she's being confined. What the people at the zoo, among other lies they tell, mm -hmm. they tell lies about Happy's inability to get along with other elephants. So what's the history though, of the times when there were a couple of other elephants there that she did have social contact with, most of, I think, two of whom have been euthanized uh, since she was there. Yeah, which really just breaks our heart that they keep having these situations where they have to euthanize elephants. Like they don't die like this in, in the natural free living world. Um, but they put four elephants in a, like this one acre pen, which again is just like putting four humans in a, like a closet or something. Uh, we have expert witnesses, expert scientists that are top of the field elephant scientists around the world. And they're like, this is absolutely too small for one elephant. And so Patty, the remaining elephant that's with Happy right now, um, she attacked Grumpy, who's, who was Happy's, um, I think it was her sibling, if not her cousin, but I think it was her sibling. And so she, you know, elephants have very astute memories. They have extraordinary minds. And she remembers that Patty uh, was the reason that Grumpy is dead. So, um, yeah, so it's really sad, but, you know, they've had other situations like at these sanctuaries where they've taken in elephants that were considered dangerous and antisocial and, and didn't get along with other elephants. And the second they were like released into the, you know, rolling hills of California or in the Tennessee sanctuary with acres and acres, they were like getting along. So it really is a testament to their needs. When, when you talk about Tennessee, because the relief you're seeking is not that the happy is let back into uh, sent back to Thailand, but to be moved to a sanctuary. And there's a big one in California and there's one in Tennessee. In comparison to the one acre they're living in now, what's what's the acreage in a place like the Tennessee sanctuary? So those are both about 2,300 acres. Um, 
And it's sometimes like, it's hard to, to picture that, but what you can picture is just hill after hill after hill. Like you have choices of where you want to roam. Um, and so it's much, it's almost the equivalent of being released to the wild. It's just that it wouldn't be practical to free her onto the streets of New York. Um, and her native Thailand isn't available either. Um, in large part, because we've destroyed the habitat in these elephants countries. So it's really horrific on both ends, but the best we can do is these amazing sanctuaries. The um, the number of people that have filed friend of the court briefs, amicus briefs in this case is extraordinary, including uh, Harvard law professor Lawrence Tribe. Mm -hmm. And um, I think sometimes people wonder, does it make any difference to have friend of the court briefs filed? But you think it does. And I think it does. How, what other kinds of amicus briefs were filed and what were the central messages that they were adding to the incredible work you did in filing the briefs in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I think they absolutely, one, propelled us to get to the Court of Appeals or at least helped us get there. We had previously filed um, some chimpanzee cases and we've always actually had Lawrence Tribe filing briefs for us, um, which is awesome. And I think that's really helped. But I think at this stage, we ended up having not the bulk that were filed at the merit stage, but still quite a lot of amicus briefs. And they were all from philosopher, like experts in the in the fields that were supporting Happy's freedom. So like experts in law, experts in habeas corpus law. We had religious and moral scholars saying that their religious texts, despite all the disagreements around religion, which mm. you know, Barry and I are both familiar with in church state land, for some reason, they all were able to unite around Happy's freedom. You know, the Jewish brief talked about how this was a violation of Torah law because she's being detained for no purpose at all. It's not like she's for food or for, you know, some benefit to society. Obviously, Peter Singer is a huge name in animal sure. rights and in philosophy, and he filed a brief in our support. And um, to answer your a question about, you know, the importance of these, in oral argument, I was being asked a question from one of the judges about, you know, could there be some sort of utilitarian purpose for keeping animals? And I didn't want to personally say yes, because I'm personally like a vegan and, or, you know, veganist sometimes. Sure. Scary, but yeah. And so I was like, oh, I don't want to say this, but I was able to be like, look at the religious briefs. And then the judge was sure. like, or oh, what about the Peter Singer brief? And so I was like, yeah, or that one. So it really gave me like an opportunity to say, it's not just us, this, these crazy animal people, it's these experts too. The non-human rights project you mentioned uh, did some chimpanzee uh, amicus briefs. And in the case of uh, was it Tony the chimpanzee, Tommy Tom, the Ch Tommy. Tommy the chimpanzee, Tommy the chimpanzee, the court ruled against uh, his release, claiming that you can't give to animals something akin to personhood. I think I'm quoting this correctly, because only beings capable of having social duties and responsibilities can possibly. Uh, possessed legal standing. Now, we know corporations can be people. And in certain cases in maritime law, individual ships are mm -hmm. treated as people. So what kind of a cockamamie idea is this, that you have to have social responsibilities and duties in order to possess a right to have someone claim on your behalf that you deserve to be out of jail? Yes, great question. So this whole thing started right with our chimpanzee cases, which were the first ever cases filed uh, back when in 2013, when we started this this project, which was to use the common law rather than statutes or the constitution, but the judge made law that's flexible, adaptable, and that's, you know, case by case. So we get happy free and it's only for happy. Um, but we were really surprised that the courts were like what we were thrown, you know, like, cause we, it just is a testament to how strong our case is, but it's, the law has never defined a rights bearer as needing to have duties. Um, children, for instance, right. do not have to shoulder duties. Um, you know, the mentally infirm people in permanent comatoses, like there was actually a member of the court of appeals of New York who wrote a concurrence for us in one of the chimpanzee cases saying, you know, I think we were wrong to not take this case before. Um, now the lower courts are really wrong because now they're creating this new standard that's never been the case. And now this threatens humans. Um, so we have to take this to overturn that. But he said that the, that they were wrong on personhood, that they've never had this requirement that you have to have rights uh, 
uh, to have duties. And it's based actually off of some uh, really oppressive version of the social contract theory, which is basically would exclude women and slaves and everyone right. else who was not part of this hypothetical contract at the start of our country, which was cited, by the way, by the court. So it was really kind of apparent that they were trying to shut out uh, people. <laughs> it, yeah, Sorry. very dangerous precedent. Um, uh, I read some of the transcript of the trial. And one of the things that bothered me for a minute was uh, one of the judges said, well, it, if we free happy, do I have to give up my dog? And I thought that was kind of insulting. But then ironically, I live in Washington, D.C. in a condominium uh, townhouse development. And we have a lot. We have 70 townhouses. And ironically, there is a guy who lives in the townhouse development who has a dog named Happy. And Happy <laughs> does seem in comparison to some of the other dogs, um, reasonably happy. That is to say, the dog comes out, it always has a ball in its mouth, it wants Joanne and I to throw the ball so it can go chase it. But then I started wondering, uh, there, there are no backyards in this development. And there are people who have two and three dogs in these townhouses. Yeah. And I just wonder if we should start to rethink the idea of pets, regardless of what happens to Happy the Elephant, mm -hmm. um, because it's just, it's simply too, it, it can't be good for even domesticated animals to live in a place with three bedrooms and no backyard. So maybe it wasn't an insulting comment. How did you think that comment, what was his intention? Mm -hmm. And then did you generally think that the judges were treating this case in a respectful way or were they just, uh, you know, some, mm -hmm. some goofy questions they wanted to yeah. ask? No, thank, thank you. Those are really, that's a good question. Um, so I think the question came from Judge Rivera and she was the one that was asking me questions kind of out the gate. And she was asking me the questions that I know would be the concern of her like call like the other judges on the bench sure. um which were floodgates related like if we rule for happy yeah what what about other species so i actually took judge rivera's question to be helpful to not waste my time with any dumb questions like she basically tried to like i felt like she was trying to ask the questions that needed to be asked rather than let another judge ask me some <laughs> sure. dumb question and by doing that then the other judges were asking me serious questions so i think i took it as a, a helpful one um and Yes, I, I mean, as I answered in 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 the argument, the science for elephants is so compelling that we don't have the same science. It doesn't mean that right, like we shouldn't evaluate whether dogs need more liberty. Um, but what we know for sure is that elephants need a lot more space and that they are, you know, extraordinarily socially complex. They have high altruism and empathy and things that we consider uniquely human is proving that elephants are like on par with us in a lot of ways that we don't have for dogs. We also know that dogs kind of co-evolved to be with humans. I think there was like a whole Cosmos episode dedicated to this oh. uh, series. But like, you know, but to your point, this our cases are under thing even though we are trying to like this is not about welfare it's not about improving the bronx zoo it cannot be improved for happy it's too small and there's not enough elephants like the fact that that's even allowed the fact that the legislation has not picked up the pieces and like the you know we don't we'd, we'd rather not have to do this like it'd be much better if there was like laws in place that were already recognizing that they have a liberty interest that should be at least you know, like a bare minimum right to just be free from this kind of confinement. Um, with respect to dogs, you know, yeah, like we wouldn't necessarily say they should have habeas corpus rights, perhaps, but something, you know, a statute that would not allow for them to be confined without proper state. Sure. Yeah. The, the um, one of the things that uh, I didn't know about until reading about Happy's case some weeks ago is that this elephant, Happy, passed something called the mirror test. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what the mirror test is and uh, what's the consequence of that when you start to look at the, the wealth of animals that might be eligible for habeas relief in the future? So the mirror self-recognition test is a barometer of autonomy. And when we say autonomous, we mean 
not just making basic choices like up or down, but that you have a sense of self and a sense of other, you know, we've got that internal voice talking to us, narrating our lives. Um, they have that too. Like I'm going to go over here. And so it's, 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 a, it's showing that they are able to recognize themselves. They basically put like a piece of ch- each animal they'll do differently. Um, but with elephants, happy was the first elephant to pass this test. And it turns out they were using two small mirrors for the other elephants, but, um, <laughs> they put some chalk, I guess, like on her shoulder or on her ear. And then they do like a placebo, you know, feeling. So then they go up to the mirror and they just instantly start taking off the um, uh. rock and a few other species have proven to do this, including I think magpies. So it's not like the end all be all, um, but there's only a few, I think it was just like bonobos, chimpanzees, elephants, and like dolphins and, and magpies. Um, but if you watch elephants doing this, like if you YouTube uh, just elephants doing mirror self-recognition, cause there's more videos now, it's, they're so human-like when they go up to the mirror, they start checking out their teeth and like <laughs> looking under their tongues and it's so goofy and cute. And you're like, how can we deny that the, you know, what kind of hubris do we have to think that these other species are not thinking and processing the world similar to us when they've evolved around the same time and in, in a way that we have, so. Wow. The, it, to what degree does it matter if, if a, an animal is sentient? What does that word mean? Because it does show up in a number of the amicus briefs. Tell us what that is and why it's relevant. And is it enough? So we've never we've never argued that sentience is enough. We've argued that autonomy is enough, or mm-hmm. sufficient but not necessary for habeas corpus because sentience is really like, and I'm no expert on, on this stuff other than just the legal side of things. But as I understand it, sentience is sort of the ability to suffer and to feel, but maybe not to make complex analytic decisions or compartmentalize the way that elephants can. But that doesn't mean, so there's sort of like the famous uh, Jeremy Bentham quote of, you know, can they... The question isn't, can they reason, but can they suffer? I think it was something like that. And I think Peter Singer sort of expounds that view. So we had amicus briefs that were far more liberal than our approach, which was like uh, Martha Nussbaum filed one that said like, all animals should have rights based on their capabilities. And personally, I think that would be lovely, but you know, we have to also be realists and we're not, we don't even have rights for a chimpanzee who was stuck in a basement in upstate New York. Sure. Um, so like, if that's allowed, we're not going to get chickens rights tomorrow. So, um, yeah. The, um, this idea of giving rights to some, at least to some animals, uh, it may be that this is the most important case argued in, in an English speaking country, but there were successes in recent years in Colombia in Argentina and even in Pakistan. Yeah. What were those cases? What kind of animals did they involve? And what was the fundamental argument there? Cause they weren't in general dealing with English common law. Right. So we cite them for the notion that this isn't, you know, the idea of giving rights at all to non-humans because they keep going, well, corporations are made up of people. And we point to the ship case and that doesn't still sink in that you don't have to be a living human being and the corporations, you know, yeah. So, um, so we point to those to say, look, other countries have had no problem giving rights to these highly autonomous beings um, like Sandra, the orangutan, and Kavan, the elephant from Pakistan. Um, I think Kavan's case was a writ of mandamus, and they think there was only one that used habeas corpus, but they're still significant for the point that, you know, there's a growing body of countries that are recognizing um, the, you know, inherent worth in the other beings that we share a planet with. Um, for about six months, I worked for Kathy Douglas, who was, of course, uh, William O. Douglas, the great Supreme Court jurist's uh, final wife. And it was a, not a project that uh, went too far. But one of the things about William O. Douglas, of course, is that he wanted there to be a whole different way we look at standing, not just for people and animals, but even for the natural world. And there was a case called Sierra Club versus Morton, Mm -hmm. where the Sierra Club went to court trying to say, we have a right to protect. Uh, It was a a big lake in California, and the Walt Disney Company wanted to uh, develop it. And and the Supreme Court said, well, you don't have standing. As it turned out, in a long story short, uh, 
it was not developed for a series of other reasons, including that Governor Reagan decided it uh, was too expensive when he was governor of California. But I always thought that there's something to be said for, as William O. Douglas said, I'm quoting him here, if we fashioned a federal rule that allowed environmental issues to be litigated in the name of inanimate objects about to be despoiled, defaced, or invaded by roads and bulldozers, and where injury is the subject of public outrage, that ought to be the standard. And there's a certain sense in which um, the outrage that people ought to feel when they see the mistreatment. I mean, luckily, you know, elephants are not in circuses anymore. That right. was a lot of public pressure. I don't think it was any uh, lawyers that, that won that, but people just look at it and say, this is disgraceful. This cannot stand. When you look at dogs, people understand cruelty to dogs. Uh, they don't maybe think it's cruel to lock them in your basement, but they sure think it's wrong to have dog fighting and other things. But I just wonder, is there something fundamentally that we could do as a culture that would understandably move this whole issue forward and allow us to think of who's, on whose behalf we are bringing cases, whether it's a, a lake yeah. or an elephant. What is wrong with this increasingly compact system we've got where it's more and more difficult to litigate? And you know this from church state law yeah. too, that you, just to get standing, just to oh, be able yeah. to bring your case into court, you have to go through uh, circles that shouldn't exist except maybe in hell. I, I mean, a hundred percent. I just weeks before doing Happy's case, I came out of the 11th circuit where my clients were personally witnessing a, an, a religious event, went to the event, and they're trying to say that there was no standing because they witnessed the event and therefore yes. subjected that. And I'm like, where's the, like, there's no precedent. There's no like principle anymore. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I definitely think that standing is, is um, important. I think with Pe with what people can do. I mean, definitely stop supporting going to zoos that have elephants. And if they do have elephants, you know, write, write them letters, write, talk to your city council. Um, Canada was successful in removing, moving mm -hmm. several the, the Toronto ones because the, the mayor was outraged. And, um, you know, AOC has tweeted about happy. She hasn't done it in a while. Mm -hmm. And folks put pressure on some of these politicians who have hearts. Sure. They care. They just don't have all the time. But if you, if people say this is important, then the politicians usually respond. So that's, that's probably the best thing to do one of the things um that uh, i think you've you've been at least one of our virtual house conscious but one of the things that joanne and i did for several years was to work for the state of new york's environmental protection organization running nature centers in the bear mountain state park and the greatest part of it I mean, it was great to be able to show kids who had never seen an animal except yeah. a rat or a dog because they yeah. lived in Harlem or they lived in the Bronx. But to release the animals at the end of the, the summer, we generally got them because they were hit by it. The mother was hit by a car, baby raccoons, baby skunks. But I remember doing a video once, a little eight millimeter film, to the tune of I shall be released <laughs> where we just, where we just released the animals. And because now three months or so, they, they have at least a reasonable chance of being able to survive in the wild. And it was just an extraordinary thing of, for us to do. Yeah. And I wish we could get to a point where we could find more places oh, yeah. where, where we could do this, where we could release them into sanctuaries. And, there are um, there are places in Texas. I, I know uh, Kinky Friedman, the Texas songwriter, has a, a place, a no kill center, where he keeps any anything as long as necessary, so that it can't they they will not be killed. But I I do think it's um, it, we we have to find a way to make cruelty of this nature become a big part. And I'd love to say that I was optimistic about that. But on the other hand, we seem to be getting more and more mean-spirited, certainly in the Senate 
in the House and in the Supreme Court. Yeah. Well, I'd what like to think you, that, what, yeah, I was going to say, yes. I'd like to think that we could unite around elephants. And, you know, I was, as I was flying back from the hearing, I was picturing like all the states kind of creating some long migratory path for elephants, you know, to get, <laughs> you know, so they don't have to ride, like they don't have to do that miserable ride. And just instead of having CAFOs, you know, the big animal feedlots that are not providing nutrition to America to use those, you know, we say we love elephants, we want to protect their habitat abroad, why not protect it here and create more sanctuaries for the remaining elephants and retire them? One of the things that happens in the wild, every 25 minutes, there is an elephant killed, as an elephant killed for ivory. And the United States is one of the worst in trafficking in illegal ivory. Mm -hmm. And what do you what do you do, though, in a world where we know that so many elephants and so many other animals, gorillas, are being slaughtered in Africa just so that they can make uh, waste baskets out of the bottom of their legs? So yeah. if, if that's, though, the argument, and that is an argument used by some zoos, at least we're protecting some animals. And there's a piece of me, I have to say, that finds a certain sympathy to that argument. Yeah. But it, yeah. It, it, tell it, me what your thought is on that. It's really not in competition. <laughs> it's not in competition. We totally support the conservation efforts of the Wildlife Conservation Society. They have like legitimate scientists that work at the Bronx Zoo that did not file affidavits against us. Um, mm -hmm. They only had the, the zoo employees file affidavits. So it's really telling that the Wildlife Conservation huh. Society is not in support of the zoo stuff either. Sure. Sure. And Wayne LaPierre, Wayne LaPierre and his wife went on a hunting trip to Africa where they shot elephants. And his wife broke several laws to smuggle the elephant back to their home so they could make chairs out of the hooves and everything you just said about them. When you look at a sociopath, a psychopath as a child, you judge how they treat animals first. You say, how? Wow, this person, like Jeffrey Dahmer, tortured animals. Mm -hmm. The way America treats animals is a leading indicator of how it treats each other, right? Yeah, I would agree with that. And we have gotten more cruel. When you look at the chicken industry and the slaughterhouses, the way we prepare our meat, we are a much crueler nation as bad as it was when the jungle was written we're killing more animals now than ever before and consuming more meat than ever before this is the issue of our time it it, it, it really is we are out of time reverend thank you please ask thank you please ask mana to come back and, and let's get all the important information Monica, I want to tell people how they can keep up with this fight. Yeah, so I was just going to my um, Twitter to see what my Twitter handle is because I'm really bad at social <laughs> media, but it's at mon underscore L underscore Miller. Um, but you can also just go to at nonhumanrights.org. Terrific. Thanks, Monica, for doing this. Thank, thank you, you Monica. Please come back and thank you, Reverend Barry W. Lynn. Go to barrywlynn.com for a treasure trove of the Reverend's sermons, lectures, appearances on television shows, and follow him on Twitter at Barry W. Lynn. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Stay out of trouble. <laughs> Only good, good trouble. Man. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye -bye.